Wednesday the 29th. And um, what we're looking at first committee, and thank you all of you other people for coming. I, this is a, um, and just know that I can't, I have an iPad, so I can only see nine people at a time. And how the, the um, squares get populated is way beyond my comprehension. So I have no idea who is there. I mean, I know who's with us, but I can't see you. So normally what we've been doing is if you wanna speak, just raise your hand. But if, if you raise your hand and I don't seem to be aware that you wanted to speak, um, just say, ask, say who you are. And because I, I can't see everybody. And so I, it's, um, I don't understand how this works at all. Oh, and there is Senator Bray. You are with us, thank you. All right, so let's get started. What I what we were going to do today is um, have just a very brief discussion about the need to digitize our land records. And we've had some um, conversations the other day about how difficult it was for uh, transactions to happen right now, whether it's real estate transactions or refinancing or any other kinds of <coughs> transactions. I would ask everybody to put yourself on mute until, you're, until you want to speak um, because it's really hard. It picks up um, and don't have it on speakerphone. Oh no, this is, now that was when we were using phones. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> so we had this conversation about how difficult it is right now to do, to look at these land records and one of the things we heard from I think it was Joy who said or maybe it was I, I don't remember who it was but there were at that point in time there were 1100 um, private transactions per homes and condos and mobile homes and this was only ones that were in the multiple list the MLS that were under contract but couldn't go anywhere because they couldn't they couldn't um, do the title searches. So, and that doesn't include any business contracts or um, apartment houses or anything else. So, or this reappraisals. Is a, or reappraisals. Mm -hmm. This is, um, no reappraisals. Um, you wouldn't need to search the land, the title records for reappraisal. I don't think this is the, the reappraisal. Unless I'm wrong. Yes, for reappraisal, if you're if you're doing um, a refinance of your home, which many people yes. are during the COVID crisis, they need they need to have access land records for titles. Yes, if they're doing a refinance or a sale or something, they need to access the land records. But if they're just doing a reappraisal from the an appeal for their tax records, they don't need to right. do that for that right. kind of reappraisal. So. What we did was talked about this uh, committee and I'd like to, that you have done work before on digitizing and um, there is a report, there are a couple reports and what we're trying to do is, and I, what I, so I, I like to just hear from kind of everybody about where we think we are and how we should do this and I'll, say where I think the committee is first. We don't feel that we could do this legislatively. We could put something in the statutes that re-energizes this committee and tells you to go forth and do it. But at this point, we think it would be faster and easier to do it by just having you here and telling you to do it instead of having it to have to go through legislation. So <clears throat> what, um, I think our, our marching orders, if you can call it that, I don't know that we have any right to give you marching orders, but we're going to anyway, um, is going to be figure out how to, how to digitize these, how to set standards so that all digitizing is done in the same way, how to deal with the 101 towns who have already done it to make sure that <coughs> they 
they can be um, incorporated into the standardized system somehow and figure out a common repository as backup for these records and how to um, enforce the standards then if that's by a, an oversight committee or a, whatever it is. So I guess um, a committee, unless you have other, other um, Brian. I think it's also important, Madam Chair, for the group to figure out the costs involved uh -huh. Yeah. and how we're going to pay for it. I had two calls this morning from clerks who said, we just finished doing the mm -hmm. paper stuff and putting them in these expensive binders. And now you're telling us we're going to have to do something digitally. That's going to cost a lot more money. Who's going to pay for it? Yes, and I think that is something that the, um, this group should be looking at. And whether there's any COVID money that could come to municipalities for that. Um, I don't know, but hopefully uh, there's enough smart minds in this group to be able to, to do it. And just, um, oh yes, there's Tanya, but you, you are backlit and I can't, it looks like you're in a witness protection program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is Tony okay. Marshall, okay. State Archivist. Um, yeah, it's the lighting in my office. I actually have windows on most sides, so I've tried everything. Yeah. But I'm not really looking at my computer for it. <laughs> Sorry if I'm but, incognito. <laughs> no, it's okay. I just I was wondered who that person was in the witness protection program, and then I saw your name. So, so committee, unless there are other comments or directions that you'd like to do, what I'd like to do is just start and go through the list of, list of witnesses and have them weigh in and how we, um, what they think um, is the right way to go forward. So I'm so, uh, gonna Matt, switch over here, other committee Madam members. Chair. Yeah, yes. just, one, just one other thing uh, to cost, which uh, I mean, single standard costs, how much, who pays, and I think time frame. it would be great to get an oh, understanding yeah. of what the time frame is. Yes, I think that what we want to do is not tell you to do another study, but tell you to, um, and we talked about this before, and Andy, in any case, said he'd be happy to be locked into this virtual room until you can come up with not just a way to do it, but the implementation plan, because right. that's, um, we, we have no idea if this might be hitting us again in, November, December, or April, May. So we need something in place so that we don't have to be having this conversation again. So um, Anthony, do you have any? No, only to say that we're asking these folks to take on this task. And you had said that we're asking them to do this as opposed to legislation. But it is possible that the group, after coming up with its strategies, may have to come back and ask us to offer up some legislation. So it's not as if we're going to abandon you to the process. If you run into things where you think we need to change the statutes in order to make it happen or happen faster or allocate the money to make it happen, you will come back to us with ideas for statutory changes as well. Yes, yes, well said. Chris, do you have any comments? No, I mean, I, I was looking at my list uh, from last meeting on this, and you've gone over everything. And, uh, and then Anthony added the last thing there. So we're, okay. we're looking to help, but um, we know we're not going to do more than try to facilitate. And we, we could have just, um, we supposed, just uh, asked you to... Um, do it, but we thought it might uh, somehow having a Senate committee at, invite you to come might seem more compelling to some people than just asking you to go away and do it. So that's why we're doing this and we're going to hear from people and then we're going to, as Anthony said, butt out until we're needed again. So with that, what I would like to do, I guess, is just I'll just start and go in line of what my participant list said and have you weigh in and see what um, where we are and if you have any suggestions and not necessarily today talking about how it could be done, but about 
the process and how you regard um, what we're asking you to do. So with, and I'm gonna put myself on mute until I call on the next person. And if committee members have any questions, please um, just raise your hand or shout out, okay? So uh, first on my list is Chuck Starrow. Uh, good afternoon, uh, committee. Chuck Starrow, Leonine Public Affairs. I'm here on behalf of uh, Connecticut Attorneys Title Insurance Corporation in my contact at the uh, company, uh, Andy Michael is also in this meeting. So um, truth be told, I think I, what I would do, Andy, sorry to catch you flat footed maybe, but turn it over to you um, at this stage. Okay, Andy, Thanks, thank you, Chuck. Chuck. That was very concise, great <laughs> testimony. <laughs> we love it. <laughs> thank you to the committee, uh, Andy Michael, uh, Vermont Attorney's Title and Caddick. Uh, thanks to the committee for taking this up, and I appreciate your your guidance and the, and the gentle nudge. Um, I think it is important for the the folks on this panel or committee, whatever we're creating, to understand our uh, our goal. Um, I think we're all ready to go. M my vision, uh, I guess, and others can weigh in. Or I I understand the task to be to get in a room and come up with a, a single system uh, with some kind of rules and regulations and come up with the cost. And I agree, we, if we come up with this platform, we will come back and likely need some legislation to, among other things, create a, a commission or some kind of regulatory body on a going forward basis that can implement the platform and the design the cost will probably be a challenge. My vision is that we create a platform and we st start on day one and we move forward. And the second tier question may be, how do we get 200 years of existing records into this system? That may be a different challenge, but I don't think, I hope it won't stop us from designing a new platform that at least going forward in five, 10 or 15 years, we don't find ourselves uh, exactly where we are now. I'm gonna guess or, or hope that within the first meeting or maybe two, this uh, ad hoc committee will be on one page in terms of how we see it being implemented and designed. And if we're not, um, yeah, I don't know if we're going to be able to come out of our unlocked room, but we, we may have to report back that with some of the divergent issues, we're so far apart that either we do need legislative help or, or each group would go its own separate way uh, and come up with its different designs and present them to the legislature to, to choose one. But I do remain optimistic that everybody sees the problem, knows the problem, is committed to resolving the problem, that we can create one single uh, jurisdiction that anybody can access the land records and they'll be in a uniform uh, and concise recording system. Committee, any uh, questions for Andy up to this point or should we just keep going? Yeah, this is Chris uh, Bray. Um, okay. I have a question. Andy, and that is, you were mentioning uh, 200 years worth of records, which I hadn't really thought about how far back they go. For towns that have already gone ahead and started to digitize, uh, have are any of them have any of them done all of their records, all extant records, or you know, just a, going forward will digitize, but past is going to stay paper. Yeah, excellent question. And Tanya may be in a better position to answer it. I, I believe some municipalities have gone all the way back. I don't know how many, um, but even if they haven't gone back to the 1700s, they go back a very significant time period, which for 97% of title searchers, uh, they're generally looking for about 40 or 50 years of records. Um, and yes, the other ones are important, but again, to me, that's phase two or phase three, unless they already exist. And I will naively say, maybe it's as simple as pushing a button to get it from their existing digital platform to this new platform, but 
that's a question for a technology person, certainly not me. Okay, so I think we'll move to Bobby is next on our list. Hi, um, I've, I've served on a few commissions and study groups in the past. And the question that's always been first in my mind is for the clerks that are not already digitizing, we need to figure out why they're not. I know in some towns it's gonna be a, a question of cost, um, but for some towns it's hesitancy on the part of the select board to allow it. And in some towns, it's a question of resources and time and technology. Um, but for the towns that have already done it, I, I don't see the need to build a new platform. There are really only a couple that are being used already in the state. I don't see why we need to build something new when we already have a couple of pretty good systems. I think we could simply build a website to direct people to the right portal. There are already portals out there, but we need to figure out why the clerks who are not digitizing, what's holding them back. I think especially now with, with the situation we're in, I think most clerks want to do it. Um, all the clerks here in this virtual room right now have already done it, but I think, I think we could, encourage more clerks if we could figure out why it's not being done. And if it's financing that's holding them back, let's figure out a way to provide it. If it's um, technical expertise that's holding them back, let's figure out how to provide that. And if it's their select board that's not allowing them to, let's convince them. But I don't think we need to start over from scratch when so many of us do have so many years worth of records and we've already chosen the system that works best for our size town. I don't think there's gonna be a one size fits all system that works for everyone. But I think I think most clerks want to do this. They're ju they just haven't been able to so far. And I so know Don, go ahead. So perhaps this speaks to the need to have uh, not only the clerks um, here, but to have maybe um, a couple of representatives from VLCT that represent the, that also represent the select boards and get them involved. Hi, well, this is Karen. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to mention that I am on the call. Thank you. Okay, Karen, I will put, I'll add you to the list here. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. So I think that, and I, I don't know a lot about technology, but it seems to me that it is a little bit like, um, I know when we were talking about other things, it's a little bit like, um, and Chris Delia will understand this, like um, I can use my ATM card so that there's, a, there's kind of a spine, there's a backbone there. And even though I want to, withdraw money from Brattleboro Savings and Loan, I, I can go to People's United Bank to their ATM machine and somehow that spine gets us all connected and maybe that's the maybe that's the platform. But that's something for you all to figure out how that will will actually work. So any questions for oh sorry Bobby. Yeah. Go ahead. I think I think the biggest question that maybe the legislature will have to answer is how to pay for this. Yes. We we changed the we had the fee bill last year to say we have now have a restoration fund or a computerization fund in every town, but it's going to take some time to build up the funds in towns that weren't weren't saving for this. And you are right. We we I don't think we heard from any clerks when we were doing that. I don't think we heard from any clerks that they didn't want to do it, but they, many of them, the select board hadn't set up the restoration funds. Do, uh, and some, no. of them, some of them have their records digitized now and want to put them, make them accessible on the internet and their select boards won't allow it. Yeah. So maybe there needs to be some clarity about whose decision it is. 
the select okay. board holds back the purse string. Yep. Allison, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I, I just on the subject of cost, it strikes me that uh, we have a, you know, the, the towns have paid for it to date. We do we I have two questions. One is, it strikes me that it's a shared, probably a shared responsibility for who pays for it, that it's town and state, but that it, um, I'm just curious how much our new fees have, have brought in, or is it too early to tell? Do we have a notion of what that fund, maybe Tanya knows what that fund has in it at the moment, or somebody? Well, it's a, the fund is at each town. Oh, the fund, okay. so. To, uh, Bobby, do you have a notion of how much that's raised additionally for you in Marshfield? Off the top of my head, no, because I put more in than, than was specified. My town's been very supportive. We've had a restoration fund for years right. and we've always put far more in than required. Um, in a town my size, maybe, Three thousand dollars. Yeah, and and do you have a notion? Do you have a? Can you give us a sense of what the co total cost was for you to digitize your records? Two hundred and twenty-five dollars a month, ongoing. And the cost of a scanner, a couple scanners, um, maybe a new computer. And and when did you start it? So we get a sense of that two twenty-five a month. June first, two thousand ten. <laughs> um, okay. And with, I, our, with our software, we are able to go back and put older records in. So we're back to 2002. But when did you actually yeah. start digitizing? June 1st, 2010. Oh, okay. 2010. So yes. I don't want to get us to get too into the weeds here of what it, this committee will be dealing with, but mainly. Um, hearing from people about the process of the committee and stuff because we're we're not the ones that are going to figure this out. You all are. So, Brian, did you have a question? I, I think I'll pass, Madam Chair. I had a question, but Bobby sort of answered it. What I'm getting is it's unlike the law enforcement reporting system where we have two systems, Spellman and one of the other is, and they're not compatible. But this is not the same situation for one and hearing. When when the commission, one of the commissions years ago had this exact same discussion, um, we were told that by one of the committee members that his high school student could build a portal that would link to the land record system I have and the land record, record system that South Burlington has. So you could have a website, you could could say I want to search records in Killington. Click on Killington and it would bring you to the portal that you need or click on Barry City and it would bring you to the portal that you need. The okay. systems already exist. Yeah. As I said, I thought you answered that already. Thank you. All right, if there aren't any more questions for Bobby, thank you. And um, thank you. So I'm going to move to Carol. She's next on my list here. Hi, Carol Dawes, Barry City Clerk and Chair of the Vermont Municipal Clerk and Treasurer's Association Legislative Committee. Um, I don't have anything to add to what Bobby said. I think she covered it. Um, the only thing that I would say that would be another thing that the group would uh, look into is electronic recordings. I know that's another thing that um, there is interest uh, in moving in that direction and there is potential for legislation that would need to be passed to get us in there to get us there um so that's another item that would be on our agenda great any questions for carol we, and we will come back to once we get through everybody we'll come back if there are kind of general questions that anybody might um want to raise so Chris Delia, I have you next on my list. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Chris Delia, President of Vermont Bankers Association. I'm gonna take a slightly different approach because I think everybody who you have uh, 
involved in this discussion has much more day-to-day -day expertise and some have the historical context. So here's my approach. I would like to spend, I, I would like the group to distribute the previous studies that have been conducted just so I have some context as to what all was discussed way back when. I'd also like to see if there are any national models that have been uh, used in other locations, uh, uniform law commission models that might be appropriate. Uh, to support Bobby's comments, look at the existing systems that are already in place. From that, I think it's an opportunity to figure out what direction to go in, whether it's uh, grandfathering those existing systems or coming up with something else. But regardless, regardless of what you come up with, identify the challenges and obstacles to going in that direction, and then coming up with a plan to overcome those ob obstacles and implement. So obstacles being funding, obstacles being select board reluctance, obstacles being perhaps fee issues for town clerks, whatever those obstacles may be, put them on the table, given the direction that we want to go in and come up with solutions for every one of those. Look at the opportunities, uh, paying for it. I don't think we can wait till digitization funds are well capitalized at the town level. We've got to come up with something else that is going to get this off the ground because as Bobby has demonstrated with their diligent efforts, not a lot of revenue in a, cap, in a digitization fund that's gonna uh, perhaps accomplish the task that we're looking for. So I say that with just wanting to get a little bit more context so I don't repeat the previous, uh, I guess, uh, discussions, if you will, and, and not get anywhere. I don't want to get so bogged down with that, but it would be helpful for context. And then pick a direction and let's go. And over to overcome all of those obstacles that people are going to put in our way. Sounds good. Um. All right, I'm going to move right to Tan to Donna. Donna, there you are. You need to unmute yourself. You can do it. You're 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 muted. There we go. Oh, there you are. Now I am. I don't like Zoom. I'm used to go to the meetings. Um, I agree with most of what Bobby said, or almost all of what Bobby said. Um, I just to give some perspective. I was on the Land Records Commission back in the uh, somewhere around 2005, 2006, which lasted for a couple of years, um, and we went through all of these discussions you're having now. Um, and it came to be um, the realization by the clerks, there was a separation to give some context, separation of what the clerks and thought they could have versus what the state and everything else wanted. The states, the clerks wanted to maintain our records at our level. And as Bobby stated, one of the IT people from the state said his, his high school student could build that portal. So you could still have towns which have the records at their location, they process them as always, they digitize them, they put them in the system. And then what would happen is that someone would come into Vermont land records, they would click on South Burlington and they wouldn't even know they left the site. They would all of a sudden South Burlington records would show up. Uh, it was that easy and that, that um, done. Um, unfortunately, that IT person was replaced on our commission and we have someone else who came in and um, so it kind of got hung up at that and the commission kind of just died because we couldn't seem to move forward. Um, so uh, those are my biggest things. Um, but one thing I do want to put out there, um, I know Senator Clarkson rec um, said about all the number of back uh, sales that aren't taking place. Um, I know majority of the clerks in the state went against the governor's executive order and they were there in the office behind the scenes they were taking phone calls, they were emailing documents out to people. We weren't the only cog in all of this. I um, mean, the listeners were also yeah. cogs in this, the bankers, the, the, everybody was. So I wanna make sure we pull this back yeah. from that this is a clerk issue and this isn't a clerk issue because many went above and beyond. I know myself, we're still letting people in silently um, so they could do their, their work at, at our risk, yeah. <laughs> so um, that's all I wanted to say. Yes, we understand that 
clerks were very, very creative here and um, that that there were a lot of steps along the way that presented problems. So but this we're is not, not the only, to, I mean, if yeah. you're really truly looking by having records online, they also have to look at the assessors as well. It's not just the clerks issue. This is assessors, zoning and planning, all of that has to be out there. It's a bigger issue than just the land records. Oh, it is, but we have to yeah. start someplace. Correct. We need, yeah. Okay, Jim, where are you? Oh, there you are. I'm here. Um, I really I, don't have anything to add. Oh, wait, did, uh, did I hear somebody? Oh, I guess not. Okay, sorry, sorry. Okay, hey, go ahead, Jim. All right, um, I don't have anything to add to what people have already discussed. Um, I don't know exactly how this group will proceed, but I do think that it's really important to identify our goals up front because I think there are a lot of people here who have different perspectives on getting to a different place. So I think getting a unified set of goals up front is really important. And I don't think there's really any interference with getting this done other than money. And I think people are going to be surprised at the cost of how much, how much it's going to cost, particularly if you're going to do historical, because starting today and going forward, is great. That means 40 years from now, somebody can do a title search. If we think there's going to be a resurgence of this problem in December, and we will not have finished the process of even beginning digitization by December. So realistically, we're talking a couple of years here to get this system up and running. But, um, I think funding is going to be the big issue and we're really going to have to help a lot of the smaller towns. I mean, I, I unfairly certainly pick on Tynmouth and Baltimore when I'm doing seminars because I know those are two very small towns. If they have a couple hundred dollars in their newly created fund, I'd be surprised. And I think you're talking thousands to tens of thousands of dollars to get towns up and running and back at least somewhere between 50 and 80 years of records. And if you take tens of thousands of dollars by 150 towns, 175 towns, that's an impressive amount of money. And with that, I'll wait and hear what other people have to say. May, may I ask a question, Chair? Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, Jim, it's good to see you. I'd like to I, go to your first comment. Um, other than the fact I represent Baltimore, the only town in Vermont that has no paved roads. Um, I, I would just like to ask you about when you talk about unifying the goal. Uh, for I, I think it would. What do you view the goal being? What do you view the goal being? Okay, the highest the highest level goal is that someone anywhere who needs access to Vermont land records should have a single place to go and access those records. That means you need to address both public access as in a portal to get there. You need the records digitized and those are two separate processes. That, yeah. that because you digitize your records doesn't mean they're automatically online. I, I think Bobby mentioned, and I'm a big fan of this. We've got two companies that have been digitizing Vermont land records for a long time. And they all have portals. And they know how to do it. And they know how Vermont records work. They've created their index process. They've created all the mechanisms to make this work. We really should be seriously looking at not starting over, but using those two systems and helping the towns that can't afford or can't convince their select board to do it, to build on those systems because they work. And yes, I know some practitioners say, well, it's really expensive to use one of the other systems. It is, 
it's expensive to maintain an online portal with digital access to these systems. You can't, you can't do this for free. The, the, this is gonna need money to get started and it's gonna need money every year to keep that process going. Did I answer your question? I'm never sure yeah. if I answer the question. No, it, 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 that's exactly what I wanted you to say. Which is that, that that's a great; those are great goals. I, I applaud them, a, and um, I I think you're right. And I to go back to Andy's comment, I think we're going to have to phase it. You know, phase fifty years, but and then next phase. You know, and if you guys will figure that out, but it's clearly, and it's I, I'm amazed that one town. Uh, Bobby's town has spent over two million dollars doing this already, or two hundred and seventy no. two hundred and seventy thousand already. That's a lot of money. Allison, I, yeah. I believe that Bobby has a correction there. I, I don't think that that's what she said. No, two hundred and fifty dollars a month. It started at two hundred. It started at two hundred dollars a month when I, I started. Said, yeah, two twenty five a month times ten years. That's a lot. So that's 30, maybe $30,000. 225, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. You guys will figure it out. What I, what I also wanna make clear is the money that we're getting in the, because of the fee bill, the $4 a page that's allocated, that's enough to pay for my system. That's enough for anybody not with my volume of records to get that system done today. And I'm, going to show my, I'm going to show my ignorance finally by asking Bobby what the monthly fee is for. Is that to maintain the records? Well, I that, is, that, is, that is the licensing fee for the software that I use. Oh, my goodness. I didn't realize that. And okay. I'm um, okay. Are we okay with that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. sure. So I'm yeah. going to move to Joy. Oops, I have a question, Madam Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. I or Mr. Yeah. Knapp, um, or Bobby, actually, since, but the when you're talking about um, a, a couple major pieces of software that do this, Brand X and Y, I don't know what they are. Um, does Do they also host all your records? Uh, or are they local and all you're paying is this, the fee to, to run that software in your shop, but all the records are actually served off of your own spot or are they in, a, in the cloud, in a repository? Oh, I'm gonna let Bobby answer that one. I don't know how the systems actually work. I only know how the portals work. Anyone know? It looks like we've lost Bobby. We've lost Bobby. Carol, do you know? Yeah. The to um, with the system that we have in Barry City, um, and just to give you a frame of reference, our system costs uh, about $13,000 a year, so a little over $1,000 a month. Um, they the, the fee covers, um, actually, in our case, it covers all the hardware. They have provided us with. Um, computers, scanners, printers. Uh, so it covers the hardware, it covers the hosting um, for the scanned documents, indexing, um, the online access, uh, and uh, they also uh, archive our documents um, by way of microfilm, so. Great, and just one more, because this is really about the whole central repository question. When, when, when someone calls up your records, are they actually speaking to a computer in your office to get that data? Or are they speaking to the company that you use to get that data? They're speaking to the company. Thank you. Sorry, my, I'm sorry, my Wi-Fi quit. <laughs> so I the problem with for, electronics. Uh, jumping out in the middle of you. <laughs> All right, so are we ready to go to Joy? Okay. Uh, hi, thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Joy Limoges. I'm an attorney in Williston. I serve as general counsel for 
Vermont Federal Credit Union, Equity Council for Northfield Savings Bank. And as a result, I work with Andy Michael pretty much on a daily basis all day, much to his chagrin sometimes. Crystal Lee has said everything brilliantly, quite frankly, and, and I, I would echo his comments on, I, I think, finding some sort of a uniform goal. And I won't reiterate everything that he was saying, but I would like to very much be part of this group. Okay, great. Any questions for Joy? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. I just I'd like to applaud her historic clock behind her head. It is spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> you like those hands off the clock? We're just like ma manufacturing time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, Nancy. Where are you? There you are. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am going to actually pass my time because the chair of our government affairs, oh, Nancy Lynch, for the record, the government affairs director for the Vermont Association of Realtors. But I'm going to pass my time to the chair of our government affairs committee, Peter Tucker. Um, uh, I was originally on the, uh, the uh, committees that met last year, but I think Peter may be taking it forward. So if that's all right with you, Madam Chair. Sure. That's fine. Thank you. Peter, you I, are next on Madam, the list anyway, so. Okay. Um, Peter Tucker, uh, Vermont Association of Realtors, uh, uh, Chairman of Government Affairs Committee. Um, so thank you, you know, for inviting me uh, to this, uh, this group. Um, you know, as I've listened to other folks, you know, it, it, what occurs to me is that, you know, 101 towns are digitized right now. That, that there's some pretty good programs in place. As, as Jim Knapp mentioned, there's two companies that are doing you know, the lion's share of this work. Um, it also occurs to me that, that really doing a survey of all towns you know, so that we be, begin to understand you know, what, are the, you know, what are the true impediments um, to, to digitizing land records. Um, and you know, I think that that's gotta be a, a place for this, this group to start. Um, as far as as funding and financing of this, you know, it, it does seem like it's going to be there's going to be a cost involved in it and, a, and an ongoing cost just to go forward and then this additional cost to go backwards, uh, at least 40 years would be the, uh, the final objective, I would think. Um, so do title searches online completely. Um, and when you talk about the, the cost of doing this, you know, one of the things that that occurs to me is towns that have put in a substantial amount of money already to get their fund, they get their records digitized um, and making sure that whatever we come up with is fair to them. You know, they, they've made the investment um, and, and still allows for towns that, that don't have the resources, potentially small towns, things of that nature, um, to also be treated fairly. So it's, it's going to be a real challenge, um, you know, on the funding end to, to, to make sure that the balance is correct. But uh, you know, I think we really talked to, to all the towns, and we certainly have people in this group that are talking to all the towns. Um, that you know, we can kind of break it down into different groups of, of you know who's doing what. Um, look at platforms that are working. Uh, you know, I said you know my thought was to go outside of the state to look. You know, what's the state that's doing this the best, and uh, look at what their platform looks like. But if we have some companies here that are doing it effectively right now. Um, you know, perhaps we find a, uh, a preferred vendor. Um, and if we could go to that person and say, look, you know, we'll, we'll contract for the, you know, all the towns in the state of Vermont, um, there should be some kind of cost savings or negotiations um, to, to create a, uh, you know, a budget that we can live with. Thank you. Thank you. So I think I'm gonna go to Lucretia, are you still with us? There you are. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. So, <laughs> so I've agreed with everything that Bobby, Carol, everything that's been said. Um, uh, I think that one of the other things and I've mentioned it before is the, uh, you know, coming up with a standard standardization of how we record certain documents and how we index things. But a lot of the questions have been coming up. We have started collecting data from towns, we have um, the first year of data from last year um, 
that and so this coming year we'll be collecting the data with the first year of, re, of the increase in fees um, we are also um, obtaining the data of the towns that are digitizing what their plans are for digitizing and we're hoping to see a progression so that three years from now when we have to present our report um, to the legislature uh, to let you know where we're at uh, that information will be there um, you know, I don't think it's, it's it's not going to be a quick process, but I think it's a very doable process. And, um, and you know, it depends on the condition of how these towns have been indexing those that are not digitized yet. If they have some type of a computer index, I know some towns at least are maintaining that. Those are much easier um, to convert to a digitized system and, and quicker. Um, but I think that's, uh, it's, it, I, I feel that the COVID, this, this situation that we're in has certainly shined a light on the fact that we do need to move in this direction. You're right. We're learning a lot about things that we should have done before and need to move forward with. Um, uh, um, I have John Adams. Thank you, Lucretia. Hi. 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 Uh, I'm John Adams with the director at the Center for Geographic Information. Um, and I'm just here interested in keeping tabs on how this evolves, uh, learning about you know the challenges municipalities are facing, um, seeing if there's any insight that we can can add as, as issues come up. Uh, we manage the statewide pro, um, parcel property uh, program, digital uh, parcel program. So uh, anything we can do to make our systems more interoperable um, with the future of digital land records, uh, we'd like to. Well, you are now part uh, of this committee. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Okay, um, Terry, are you uh, here? Uh, who, who's trying to speak? Um, somebody? Madam Chair, it's Chris Bray. I have a question yes. from Mr. Adams. Okay. Um, so John, I'm just trying to understand the relationship between land records at the municipal level and your parcel maps. Um, are, are you just getting a feed from the town or are you, have you constructed these, this data set from scratch? So um, the construction of, of the, the initial data set which was completed uh, late last year was a, a, a three year project um, that involved uh, contractors uh, across the state and, and many um, existing leveraging the existing work that a lot of municipalities had done. Uh, so we essentially created a standard and tried to get everything fed into uh, a single statewide layer. And now we're in the process of keeping it up to date. And to do that, um, we do it a number of different ways. Some municipalities do keep their own parcel data up to date and they um, feed it to us and then we integrate it into the, the statewide layer. Um, some of the contractors that they work with will uh, deliver us the digital data. And then some municipalities, you know, are not going to be able to, to maintain this over time. Um, so our approach to that thus far, and it's, it's still very new, is to um, take digital surveys. So, so now uh, any survey that's for a subdivision or boundary line adjustment that's recorded in the land records we receive a, a digital copy from the surveyor from, from that we can um, draw the line work and then every year when the uh, grand lists are submitted we can, we can try to join the uh, so it's um, uh, we take the best available information we can get from municipalities and, and go from there and is it i don't know enough about these records are the records that you have for municipalities that have not digitized their own records, are they potentially a data set that could sort of jumpstart the municipality's own 
data set or are they enough different that the, the, they're, you know, they're similar, but they're always going to be two different sets? Well, uh, it certainly helps them with their parcel data, but I think that end records are, are, totally, are totally separate. Okay. Um, you know, the, um, the line work that we get, the surveys are just a fraction of what is recorded as, as, as land records in the um, right. municipalities. Thank you. Um, okay, I have, Terry, I have you, are you here for this? Can you, can you hear me? Yes. I am, and I'm so sorry to be late. I went from your other um, Senate committee, Senator White, um, to a conference call that went longer than expected. But it looks like if Andy Michael and Jim, Jim Knapp have already spoken, I'm sure they have covered anything much better than what I would cover. I just wanted to say on behalf of the bar, we're so grateful to you and your committee for being willing to uh, take this whole issue forward. Um, it's something that a lot has been done on in the past, and I think we're very much poised to go next, and we really, really appreciate your leadership. Thank you. Um, thanks, Terry. Uh, we've seen a lot of each other this morning. Uh, Karen, are you still with us? Are you there, Karen Horn? There. Yes, yes, I'm okay. here. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Yeah, Would you like to wait? Um, thank you. So I think that um, we are happy to work um, on this group and you've gotten all kinds of great suggestions from everybody, it sounds like. The one thing I would um, mention, which is an opportunity, I think, is that this the whole issue having been thrown into um, relief by the COVID crisis makes us think that there might be an opportunity to use some of the CARES Act funding to actually help digitize the records. And uh, alongside of that is there's a lot of discussion um, in the legislature right now about using some of the CARES Act funding for um, high-speed internet everywhere. So I, I do think that those two issues are related and, and we should try to make the case for some of that CARES Act funding to finance this effort. I, I, think, you're, I think you're right. And I think that um, the probably one of the things that could, um, I mean, we have some sense of what it costs towns to maintain and so there might be some ability right away to for the group to figure out some some budget um, constraints that we might be able to uh, use for the COVID with COVID money. So Allison. So um, as we think about the money, you know, Bobby only mentioned the cost of the licensing per month, which she didn't mention her time. And so I would remind everybody that it's a ton of time uh, on the clerk's part too. So we wanna make sure we build that into the cost. I mean, yeah. Well, I think that we're gonna to have to build lots of stuff into the cost of it, but we have to be right. in terms of COVID funding. Um, I'm not sure that they will care much about the clerk's time, but might care about the, um, they don't the licensing to, fees. They, yeah, they well, don't need to care about it. No, they I don't. I mean, help. not care. I mean that be so that we can be um, eligible right. or whatever. Chris, exactly. Um, I don't want to uh, complicate things, but I, I had since our last meeting on this, I looked on the NCSL website to see if there was already you know background, useful background information on electronic land records and stuff like that. And I found an awful lot on electronic records, much less on land records. And it just raised the question for me, uh, and this is where I, I don't know, is should this be part of a bigger conversation because more and more records will be electronic or is it, you know, do we want to steer away from thinking about it more comprehensively and just say, we're only going to talk about um, land records. And the reason I just bring that up is it, there might be choices you would make if you contemplated having electronic data 
of seven different types, one of which will be land records, as opposed to just a land records only specific system. That's all. I think that you're probably right that it is a larger and that they all integrate. But I think if we try to take on too much, we'll get so bogged down in it that we will never get anywhere. This is a very discreet, and they do they, they do inter interrelate. But I, this is something that um, we need to we need to deal with right away. And if we if we look at all electronic filings, all electronic records. I, my belief is that we will get, um, it'll be like um, uh, the difference between um, uh, easing the world hunger and having a food shelf. I, I mean, we need to start. Anyway, Allison. So I go back to Carol Dawes comment, which is, it is an opportunity. and. Uh, I would leave it to them if if I would leave it to this incredible group of people, and and I if Carol and the rest of them feel that it, it it's appropriate and easy, relatively easy to have that integrated conversation of electronic filings as well, then we should have at it because I think Chris is right and Carol's right. We have an opportunity, and if it's cheaper and smarter. To, to integrate those from the beginning together, that might make total sense. But I think this committee that we're um, delegating to do this work should, should, should look and see if that makes any sense as they go forward. We just need to be, I think, very careful that we don't overwhelm them because there are a ton of types of electronic records that have nothing to do necessarily with towns and electronic filings. There's wills, deeds, I mean, all of these um, advanced directives, there are tons of things that are electronically filed. And I, if, they, if there are some very discreet issues that they think connect nicely with this, then I would say, go ahead and do it. But I don't want them to think about the world of electronic filing because that is humongous. Right. Well, so I hesitated to ask the question, but I thought <laughs> just to offer it, I don't want the perfect to become the enemy of a good solution here. I right. just, on the way in, worth, worth putting the question on the table. That's all. Yes, it is. I mean, we have electronic healthcare records. We, there are there's a bazillion electronic filings out there, and I think we can't overwhelm them. So with that, I'm going to jump to Tanya. I think, is there anybody else on the, here I've been trying to keep a list of who was here for this. And I think everybody has weighed in. Um, I'll jump to Tanya and then I'm going to. Um, Chris, uh, Chris Campany hasn't weighed in and. Um, I, I didn't John, see him here. And John Quinn hasn't weighed in. Oh, I, they were not on. They're not company. here. The, oh, okay. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know that. I don't know who's here. I'm just reading from our you, agenda. You can, if you look, Allison. If you look up at the top, there's a thing that said says participant list, and it tells everybody who's here. Oh, well, that requires so, getting very close. <laughs> so, um, Tanya, Don. can we jump to you? And then um, I'm going to try and um, wrap this up and. Um, spring some surprises. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, this is Tanya Marshall. I'm State Archivist and Chief Records Officer for the state. I'm also Director of the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration and Secretary of State's Office. Um, for those who know me, I'm, I'm kind of retro record centric. So I, you know, what I have to say for land records is what I say to the judiciary for court records and, and all across the board. Um, just, just for perspective, I do want to, um, you know, support whatever the committee is going to take on as uh, a charge for this particular committee. Um, when I look at things, I just do want to point out that, you know, our current statutes um, for land records, and I always start with the legal record uh, keeping requirements, are paper based. And we have paper based recording. Um, and there's processes by which, you know, records can be made accessible digitally through scanning. Um, but in order to make them actually continue to be viable 
there's a lot of requirements around standards for that. So when we work with agencies and departments and different um, public agencies across the state, um, I just want everyone on the call to kind of recognize that our current laws require paper-based records and paper-based recording. And so, you know, for the work that's being done within the counts and digitizing, there's always a liability or risk that occurs when the laws don't match what's actually being done in practice. Um, so I just want to have that kind of laid out for that. Um, the other part is that um, to get to Senator Bray's question is that everything that's being digitized is electronic. So there so we're talking about electronic records. Um, there's also a component for digital preservation. Um, and that is something that, you know, statewide, the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration has a digital preservation system. We're the only ones in the state um, that currently have that. Um, one of the charges that I have as um, state archivist is to always look for opportunities for enterprise systems. Um, so in other words, like we're providing digital preservation support or on target to do that um, for different state entities, um, including the judiciary, uh, which means that those records will be preserved in um, our system, but we don't own them. They're owned by the judiciary. So I just want to point out that there is a component for electronic records. If we expect to access them 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, that those records have to be in a digital preservation system, um, and that system can be attached to an actual uh, recording system. Um, so those are those just, I just want to lay that part out. Um, you know, with the land records, um, I think Donna Kimville and I go way back as Bobby as well um, for the Municipal Land Records Commission and so forth. Um, you know, I, I think it's what the committee decides or what the legislature decides to do, but I do want to point out that there's a roadmap. Um, when I hear digitizing records, it makes me really nervous because the roadmap that we see in other jurisdictions for recorders are really going on to electronic recording. And the benefit that we have that other states did not have or that we did not have when the um, Municipal Land Records Commission, which, which I chaired and then Donna did, um, were, you know, there's industry standards and best practices across the board for real estate or real property documents. Um, there, you know, there were a lot of early adopters in the late 1990s and early 2000s um, who have really just coalesced nation nationalized. So there's a lot of industry standards and best practices. There's a suite of unified or uniform laws um, that are available. Um, we've already adopted one of them, the um, un Uniform Electronic Transaction Act came out in 1999. The state of Vermont adopted that in 2004. Um, but there's also the uh, Uniform Real Property Electronic Recording Act. Um, and that doesn't actually make um, any electronic recording happen, but it does enable it to start um, with certain conditions. It does require a public body or a state agency to be a standards entity. Um, and then there's also the revised uh, uniform law on notorial acts. Um, the state of Vermont just enacted portions of that last year. There's been a 2018 update. Um, so I, I hear a lot of the digitization and that makes me nervous because I really think at this stage, if we're really trying to move ahead as a state, we really have to talk about electronic recording. And what does that do that allows the ability moving forward for electronic to electronic transactions? It allows clerks to do what they're currently doing, which is underneath that, it gives them the capabilities by actually scanning a paper document that comes in and making it accessible electronically. And that's the big difference in our current law is there's a gap in there. So it doesn't mean that's gonna cause issues, but when I look at marketability of title and potential, there, there's just a legal gap that's enough there that we do see areas and outside of this that can cause some type of issue. Um, so I think there's little baby steps, but we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but it's really whatever, you know, this group really wants to do. But, you know, as state archivists, I'm always looking, I mean, land records are archival. They're permanent records. We don't want to lose them. Um, it's really talking about what is the best approach moving forward with the, the next recorded document that comes in and then retrospectively looking at everything that's been recorded and preserved because it's really the paper or microfilm that is the legal preserved copy for everything up into a certain date. Um, but if we're looking at the big picture, you know, and I look at my charge, I want to make sure these records are preserved. 
I want to make sure that they're, you know, um, preserving rights and that we have the right types of systems to support the clerks and what they need to do. Um, and so, you know, my charge does include, you know, enterprise systems to try to keep costs and low costs. So whether it's something that we look at the digital preservation that we system that we use and try to have that layered on something, I'm open to that, but I'm just here to kind of support whatever decisions made on moving forward. Um, but I'm always going to be looking out for the records and just making sure that we're putting ourselves in the best position to not lose records and also not create liabilities for anyone. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I actually think that you're here for far more than that. And um, I'm, I'm going to do something now. I'm going to say that we will, our committee will write a letter to all of you who are here today, summarizing a lot of the issues that were brought up and where we think that you might be moving in what direction and encouraging you to do that. We can't make you do it because there's no legislation to make you do it, but we're hoping that you will so that if everybody can make sure that Gail has um, your email, we'll send it out to you and ask you also to have additional people that you think are um, necessary to to do this, to work with them. Um, I think that we will not call this the land records digitizing committee, but we'll call it the bringing our land records into the 21st century task force. And because I quite honestly, the difference between electronic records and digitizing kind of escapes me. So I'll leave that up to you all. And I would like, um, don't, faint here, but I would like actually to ask Tanya if you will convene this group and then you can choose a different chair if you want, but we need to have somebody responsible for kind of uh, moving this forward. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I would be happy to convene the group if that's what the committee would like. Second. Okay, committee, where are you with this if we do this? <laughs> okay. I'm okay. I'm, I'm okay. I was sort of hoping to hear that Tanya was saying, and you kind of prompted her into saying, I'm happy to participate with this group the way everybody else did. And uh, so I didn't hear Tanya say that. So she I did. Was, uh, I, I, yeah. I was. Uh, she did. Well, she said. Yeah. She said it. Right, anyway. For Tanya's perspective, land knows, records wasn't on her agenda this year, but. <laughs> right. <laughs> she knows what I mean. Right. <laughs> but many of us have um, taken on a lot of things that we never thought we were going to be doing this year. Oh. And, and I don't know that, I think that there are many suggestions here. And I, I don't think that as has been pointed out by many of you, we're not starting from scratch. There are other studies that have been done task yeah. forces there are other states that have done it there is some uniform law commissions that have been looking at these kinds of things so i, I think that um you, you can start off you're in a good position to to move forward and then to come to us and you need um need changes in the statutes to um move forward to implement what you're going to come up with. So I, I would um, say that we can just send you away to your virtual room and um, make, have you um, going, going forward. And, and just, I guess um, it might be good if we had a, a check-in after a while to see where you are. And, and if there are things that you can think of right now that um, particularly as Karen pointed out, that might be um, where there might be accessible access to money from the COVID money. Madam yeah. Chair. Peter, yeah. Hi, it's Peter. Um, yeah, and my question was, you know, what's the time frame to apply for CARES Act funding? Is, do we we end haven't end any idea. It, I mean, it depends on if it's, there's so many different ones. And my understanding is that one of the ones that's going to be coming up will, might have money for municipalities. But I think that that's, and I think that you can work probably with, um, I would ask around that, that you maybe, um, Tucker is a good source there and 
probably somebody in joint fiscal. I don't know if it would be Nolan. He may mainly um, deals with health issues, but somebody in joint fiscal would have an idea of what the different application processes are and deadlines. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Any other questions or anything before we jump to our next issue? So thank you everybody. This was really helpful and I will send out, there are tons of um, things in here that we would like to put in, I think, into your charge or whatever we're calling this. And thank you so much for being willing to do this because I think that this, and you're right, this um, will take some time but had we start, had we actually implemented something and been serious about it in 2000, uh, I think the last study was 2006 is what I'm remembering, we wouldn't be here right now. So the, as we've been told a lot of times, the best time to start was 10 years ago, but the second best time to start is today. So. All right, thank you. Thank you Thanks, everybody. Sarah. And you're certainly thank welcome you. to stay around and keep joining us. We're gonna deal with um, quasi municipal boards right now. So feel free to stay with us. How to clear a room. <laughs> <laughs> oh really? I have to see that your experience of that. It just happened. Oh my God, yes, look at it. it goes boom, 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 boom. Yes, they're all leaving. Um, there, go, there go those committee members. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> committee members can't leave. All right, so, um, and I just got one of these pesky invites, a notification. I, I want to get rid of all of those. Anyway. Um, is, and it if for, I, is, it, is it for tea time? No, it's from <laughs> L... NLWG, whatever that is. The golf courses aren't open yet, Allison. <laughs> so <laughs> if I press on that, then it tells me that I have to go away and then I have to enter back into the meeting because anyway, you don't want to hear all my woes. Um, so, so Madam Chair, you know those annoying notifications that keep popping up? Yes. At some moment when they pop up and you're not running a meeting, <laughs> Uh, if it's a, if your system is the same as mine, I'm on a laptop, not the uh, pad, but I think they're very similar. At the very bottom of that list, there'll be a little thing that looks like a gear. You click on that thing and you can say, hey, thanks very much, but stop showing me notifications. But and, that's just for that one person, right? Uh, no, you can, there's, it will list all the applications that are allowed to jump into that notifications window and you can just say I don't want any thank you oh okay yeah I don't want anything I get we get all these from NCSL and webinars and notifications from BDCC and they also send emails so okay thank you Chris <sighs> okay okay where are we with uh Tucker and Karen where are we with um our quasi-judicial and did we get anybody here, any um, appraisers or? Um... Doug Farnan was here for a bit, uh, Madam Chair, but he's left. Okay. And was he here from PDR? Well, I mean, he's he, with the tax. Yeah, he was listed as one of the uh, witnesses for the two o'clock session. Okay. He had some time constraints, though, so he wasn't able to stay. Oh, dear. How about Jill Remick? Nope. Uh, she had tried to get in earlier, and then I had communicated with her, and she hasn't returned. And I don't believe Lisa Wright will be joining us either. Well, well do we know anything talk? more than today that we can do today? I mean, are we any smarter today than we were yesterday without them? I can only speak for myself, and the answer is no. <laughs> yeah, me too. So Tucker and Karen, I guess, are going to have to tell us if we're smarter. Tucker? Well, we have a draft from Tucker. 
you were all plenty smart to begin with. Uh, I don't have much to add that would make any of us more smart at the moment. Uh, I sent you all an email earlier today with some clarification on the statutory deadlines that we were discussing yesterday. And I apologize. And, and that's, that's up on our web, that's up on our website yes. too. Okay. Yes. And I apologize for talking about the deadlines that were in statute because I didn't realize that the deadlines that are in statute are automatically and mandatorily extended by a subsequent statute. But for some reason, when that was drafted, they didn't go to amend any of the deadlines listed in statute. They left them and had a separate statute that says all of those deadlines that we've listed get extended by 30 or 50 days. Yeah. Um, so my sincerest apologies. Um, I received more information uh, from Abby Shepard who passed along some testimony that was submitted to the House Ways and Means Committee um, maybe last week or the week before. Uh, and that describes decisions that were made by the Department of Taxes to uh, automatically extend the filing of the preliminary grand lists to uh, August 15th. That is at the discretion of the municipality. Um, uh, but from what I understand, at least that initial step has been taken. I'm not comfortable and I don't quite understand how that will impact all of the other um, hearing and appeal deadlines that you've been looking at because they are not directly addressed in that extension um, order that the department put together. I will say that the last statute that I highlighted in the email, uh, when combined, with the authority you granted to administrative agencies in Act 92 to extend deadlines that are applicable to municipalities and to grant municipalities some authority to extend deadlines that are applicable um, to licenses, plans, other issues. Um, there may be some wiggle room there for the department to exercise authority to extend these deadlines um, for all municipalities without receiving a request from the municipality. So if you want me to walk through that, I can, but that last statute that I sent you authorizes the director of property valuation and review and any of those deadlines that we were looking at, if the municipality requests the extension of that deadline, um, if you- Can we get out there because- Hey, uh, somebody, somebody is um, having a conversation without being muted, and I don't know if it's a private conversation, but we don't, we shouldn't be hearing it. Thank you. And the statute there, just so that uh, we're all on the same page, is 32 VSA 4342. If you look at that, the authority that it grants to the director, take into consideration some of the authority that was granted in Act 92. There may be an argument that the department has the ability to extend uh, all of these deadlines for the municipalities at large, which is something that appears they've already taken a step to do with this filing of the preliminary grand list, uh, extending it to August 15th. That is all that I have. I summarized it in the email. Um, I don't know how this necessarily impacts the policy choices that you've been presented with as to whether to suspend the in-person meeting requirements um, or the um, in-person inspection. inspection requirements. But those, at least you have a better map of the uh, timeline than before. So I do see that Doug Farnham has rejoined us. Um, so, Doug, do you have anything to share with us? What we were uh, grappling with was um, whether or not we could suspend and how that would impact the um, in-person um, reviews or appraisals when there's a, an appeal. Right. Um, so for the record, Doug Farnham, Deputy Commissioner for Taxes um, for the committee. Um, 
I've previously been the director of property valuation. I was most recently the policy director. Um, so the grand list processes and um, everything are pretty close to my heart. Um, and um, one thing that I actually worked with the legislature successfully on while I was PDR director was making the, um, the inspections from the state hearing officer. So essentially after the BCA level, the appeals can go either Do, to- Doug, we're kind of losing your voice. You've just oh, that's odd. become Sorry. muffled. Don't have your, you don't have to have your mask on when you're <laughs> in a virtual uh, meeting. Is that coming through more clearly now? Yes. Oh, sorry. I think I had it too close to a speaker and the magnetics were interfering. Um, so, uh, sorry, train of thought. Um, after the BCA, the appeal from the town can either go to the Superior Court or the state uh, hearing officer. And one thing I was able to do working with the legislature was to change that state hearing officer inspection to be discretionary. So my personal opinion is that um, in-person inspections are not necessary to, do, to resolve a property tax dispute. I really think that you can document and you can uh, you know, either provide pho photographic evidence or video evidence to resolve these disputes. So I do think that it is prudent um, to remove the in-person requirement. I actually do think long-term um, it, it is worth considering that it, it shouldn't just be uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be an emergency measure, but I would understand why you would only make it a temporary measure um, moving something this quickly. So I do have a question about one of the things because I thought that what we heard was that if if a town if a an appellant um, refuses to allow the in person inspection, then it is as if they are um, giving up the appeal. And I, I can't remember if it was Tucker or Karen that, I think it was Tucker that talked about that. And if that is currently in the statute, how can we um, get rid of the, um, the, the in-person inspection and yet let the, um, town continue with the appeal. I, I guess those two right. things conflict in my mind. Right, you are remembering that correctly, that the, the, the BCA and the, the section of law detailing the BCA's rights is a bit older. It's a bit more, um, uh, I don't wanna to be too aggressive, but draconic is the only word that comes to mind. So it tends to err on the side of the town as far as if you don't let us in, it's over. Um, the, the property valuation hearing officer doesn't have that same language. And we find ourselves able to resolve these disputes. Now we are acting more like um, a quasi judicial impartial body in that case. But I think that if, um, if a taxpayer doesn't provide any evidence to the BCA that, um, you know, that improvements weren't made, that the listers claiming were made, then the town could easily uh, choose to decide in, you know, against the, it, against the property owner. And then they would have that document of evidence going to, going to superior court. So I do think they would lose a hammer. You're right that you would have to remove that ability for the town just to say you automatically lose the appeal. But I, I do, I don't think that will actually cause much harm to the towns to not have that, um, you know, uh, that option. Okay, yeah, um, thanks. Karen, do you wanna um, comment on that? Well, this, this is Karen Horn with the League of Cities and Towns. Doug makes it um, sound orders of magnitude more simple than we were discussing yesterday. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, um, no hazmat suits. Right, no hazmat suits, and that's a good thing. So uh, uh, I think that um, at least on, the, on a temporary basis that, that during the emergency, that that is a good solution. So do we need any legislation or anything to, to do that? Because the, the, it sounds like PVR already has the ability to 
to kind of wave that and um i i think that this is karen horn again i do think that um we might want to say something and and tucker may be able to speak to this but it sounded to me like the house government operations committee was um quite concerned that there might not be clarity around that issue tucker I lost you all for just a moment, so I would need someone to give me the issue that House GovOps was looking at. So Karen, whether there whether there need that there needs to be the in um, there whether there needs to be the physical inspection. My understanding was that House GovOps was concerned that there um, that there might need to be legislation to allow that not to happen. Right, the concern is that uh, if the statute continues to require an inspection, a physical inspection, and the town doesn't conduct it, that they're essentially creating a procedural defect that the property owner can then appeal on. So they're essentially, by not inspecting the property and carrying through with the procedures and statute, they would be handing the property owner the ability to appeal whatever the decision of that board is. Um, and because of that defect, they wouldn't really have a good basis to uh, fight or defend the town on that issue. So uh, the option that was discussed in committee was temporarily suspending the inspection requirements um, to avoid those procedural issues and to also avoid any possible contact between the board members and the property owner. Um, the discussion has gotten much more um, intimate and complex in this committee, but that was kind of the, the basis of the issue. So I, are they, I'm a little confused as to how legislation is happening right now. Are they starting are they going to introduce legislation that does this, that just temporarily um, uh, does away with the need for physical, or are we doing that? Or do you know how, how this is all working? They started the discussion and it was my impression that they were going to wait for this committee to take action on the issue before okay. they did anything with it. Brian? It's just a suggestion. We have a joint committee with the House Government Operations Committee tomorrow to take up the uh, issue of elections. Could we just add this to the agenda since we're already going to be uh, virtual communication? Yeah, good idea. And then we can figure out how we start. If Tucker, if you could have something drafted uh, and Doug, I we it may be uh what we often refer to as well most people refer to it as belts and suspenders but i often get it mixed up and call it boots and suspenders but um if the so that um towns feel a little more at ease about eliminating the need for a physical inspection um madam so, chair may i elaborate yes please um so i and, and Karen picked up on it. I probably talked uh, too quickly and was trying to be too concise. So what I was trying to say was that the, from the department's perspective, and we're advisory in these contexts, we don't, we're not a regulator here. So this is primarily just advisory. Um, we wouldn't be concerned with a law change to remove that physical respect inspection requirement. I do tend to agree with the House GovOps perspective that a law change would be prudent. And if you didn't remove that, I do think it would be a liability for the town. So I was, okay. I was jumping too quickly, I think. Um, so I would recommend a, a legal change in this area. Okay. But I think what will um, make it a temporary legal change um, instead of a permanent one, because if it's going to be permanent, I think we need more conversation. Of course. Yeah. Okay. So Tucker, could you get something drafted so that we could look at tomorrow when we meet with them? Yes, and I would just ask what the list of policy decisions that you would like to be presented in that 
is. So the issues that were brought up, um, the first part of this discussion that you all discussed last week and yesterday was whether uh, you should suspend the designation of physical meeting locations for these boards and for the listers. Yes. Okay. So uh, I will make sure that that is ready. And the second is this temporary, potential temporary suspension of the in-person inspection. For, for the BCA, for the, for the appeals. BCA. Uh, both of those are in uh, a draft uh, for discussion that the House Everybody Government Operations Committee uh, reviewed. <laughs> and they were also in, um, I believe it was version two or version 1.1 of uh, your municipal posting of notices bill. Right. So what I'll do is I will put uh, those two policy decisions into a new draft for you to discuss with House GovOps uh, tomorrow. Anthony? I have a very basic confusion. I think today, is today Wednesday? Yes. And our joint hearing is on Friday. So Friday. You all keep Friday. saying tomorrow and I'm beginning Friday. confused. Yeah. Just every day Bye. is Tuesday for me. Sorry. Friday. <laughs> Friday, you're right. So the, days, how, the way the days all blend together, it's hard to tell which one is which. Awful. How, so how today is Wednesday. Is Tomorrow is Thursday. We're meeting with the Joint House Committee on Friday. Yes. And we're in the Ag Committee's meeting Friday also, Brian, right? Uh, I believe so. I'm confused too. <laughs> so how does we, the other, the other, um, issue that we talked about was the DRBs um, and right. uh, getting rid of the necessity for them to have a physical meeting location. But do they have to do any, uh, do DRBs have to do any um, physical inspections of, of projects? Um, I know when you throw up a road, you have to do that. But um, I don't know if the DRBs do. I'm not certain. Um, as far as the DRB designated physical location requirement, that first section that you all discussed uh, on Friday applies to any mm -hmm. um, quasi-judicial proceeding of a municipality, and it was drafted broadly enough to make sure that it caught not just the grand list related appeals, but also the DRB Mm -hmm. And because there are numerous quasi-judicial panels that might be floating around in Title 24 that we hadn't caught yet, it was drafted as any quasi-judicial proceeding tied to um, similar electronic procedures. It's the open meeting law. And finally, there was a blanket clause added in there stated that they could hold their meetings electronically so long as they complied with all the other requirements for the conduct of those proceedings. And that clause was added in to make sure that the only um, procedure that was being suspended was the designation of the physical meeting location and the ability to hold the proceeding electronically. So if, if there is a requirement for them to meet at uh, the Brownfield site to figure out what's happening there, that doesn't go away. It would not, not under that okay. first section. And the suspension of the um, inspections was limited exclusively to the members of the BCA that go to inspect on a grand list appeal. Any other um, questions? May I just make one? comment regarding your question about the development review board there mm -hmm. are occasions when they do go out and inspect a property or a or a proposal um i my suspicion is that most of those are ex outside you know yeah. not inside a building but um they do on occasion do physical inspections And I think that um, as 
I guess I guess um, I'm not prepared to eliminate that right now. Anybody not else? Even, not even temporarily. Well, I, I think that the DRB is they're um, giving permits for, uh, yeah, and if like if that. if it's required for them to go out and look at a, a site, I. Yeah, as no, parents, I, I, yeah, most of them are outside. I, I think yeah. that that that's uh, giving a permit. I, I think it does require them to to know what they're doing. And no yeah, one has asked to, us to do that. Huh? Right. No one has asked us to do that. Right. Well, oh, I think we've been asked to look at all quasi judicial boards the, for their meeting site, for oh, their right, physical right, meeting right, site. Right. Not for. And I don't, I, but, I feel very uncomfortable um, eliminating the need for a DRB to go to a right, site I, and- I agree. I, I would agree. Okay, Chris. Oh, yeah, sounds fine to me. <laughs> Anthony. Nothing to add. Okay. All right, okay, so I think we might be done. Tucker, you'll have this ready for us tomorrow, a.k.a. Friday. Friday. Is that right, <laughs> Anthony? Huh? And uh, for tomorrow, a.k.a. Friday, would you like this to be a standalone committee bill, or should I prepare the draft to be added to other work that the committee is doing? Uh, which is the other work we're doing? I don't know. I don't think we are doing any other work right okay. now. I think this everything is the, else. Yeah, everything else we did is already passed. Okay. Yeah, and and anything else we're doing, we're doing kind of by letter. Okay, I didn't know if you had other projects with Betsy or you know your other fantastic ledge council attorneys that I was not yet aware of. No, I I don't think we do. Do okay. we, committee? No, I just I have questions with that are with Tucker that I sent before. So I, I, I just await his wisdom on other things. Okay. Yes. Does somebody just said Senator? I don't know who that was. But, or maybe not. Maybe it was somebody in my house saying Senator. All right. So, so can Chris? I ask a quick uh, committee question just to make sure I know about the other tomorrow known as Thursday, not Friday. Um, are we are we scheduling a Thursday meeting as well? No, Some weeks we've had Thursdays as well. Okay, so we did we did have Thursdays as well, but right. this is um, my um, I took the initiative here because I have to go clean out oh, our right, apartment. Right. Yep. Okay. And I needed a full day. The rest of us will meet because well, that's what we do on Thursday. <laughs> Maybe maybe we'll meet at the Hanover Co-op. Or maybe not. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> okay, anything else that we need to do? And so on Friday, this is going to be a joint committee. So let's all be there on time. And Randy Brock has pointed out it's really hard for people in the public out there if we're... 10, 15 minutes late. They don't know if we're not going to meet or if they're at the wrong place or whatever. It's going to be a joint committee and I have no idea how it's going to work because that'll be uh, 17 people. And um, that is two of my screens completely without Tucker or any witnesses. So, and we're going to hear from uh, the Secretary of State and Will Senning about the, particularly the municipal um, elections issues. I think that they're all set with the administration about those procedures. I think there's some still lingering questions about the general election. So we'll hear what, what they have for us up to that point. Right. Brian? I, I promise one more minute. And I mentioned this earlier in the Senate Agriculture meeting. I watched the Rules Committee meeting this morning, and there's a seven days article about the long delay of the all Senate meeting earlier this week. We went 20 minutes before we started, and they wrote a piece about the fact that we were surreptitiously deciding policy issues before we went live. 
And we have um, to really be careful if we're going to join a meeting 10 or 15 minutes ahead of when it's scheduled that we do not take up any policy. Yeah. We can talk about the weather and what we're wearing and all that kind of stuff, but we should not get into any potential uh, open meeting law uh, situations. I'll just, I'll just mention that. That's all. Yep. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, Madam Chair, it seems, uh, I, I haven't been watching the clock that closely. It seems like we've been pretty well starting on time. Is that not right? Yes. We, yeah. Well, well, we were about six minutes late today. Yeah. Okay. It, it falls in line with what we do in the state house. Let's put it that way. Actually, maybe even sooner than the state house. Perhaps so. <laughs> and, and it is hard because I know that, um, like, Anthony and Brian just got out of egg and I, I just got out of judiciary about 20 minutes before we met, but um, yeah. So, but we, we do need to be careful about, about that. Sure. Um, okay. Any other, anything else that we need to? No, I, okay. it, it is a pleasure to see you all and work with you as usual. Wait, let me see if Gail has anything she needs to. Gail? I do not have anything. Um, I will ask everybody who's attending Friday's meeting to log in earlier, and I apologize for the late login today. Um, but uh, we'll see you at 10 of on Friday afternoon. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Have a good walk. Yeah.